Okay, uh, if I could have your attention for a minute. Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'd like to welcome, I know we have some visitors in the room from other institutions around the park, so I'd like to welcome you all here today. Thank you for coming. Before I introduce Bob, um, there are evaluation forms on the tables, and if you would please complete those um, before the before you leave, and there's, I guess there's a collection box over there for the evaluation forms. So it's my privilege and pleasure today to be able to introduce Bob Prudhomme, who's professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. He's director of the Engineering Biology Program at Princeton University. Um, his uh, background in education, he got his bachelor's degree at Stanford and his PhD from University of Wisconsin in Madison with Bob Bird. So for those of you that remember that uh, transport phenomena book, Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot, and you had to tr you know, tread through that, it's a, it's a great book, but it's a hard read. Uh, that's the guy that he worked with. Um, he served on executive committees for the American Institute of Chemical Engineers Material Science Division, U.S. Society of Re Rheology, and he is uh, current, uh, sorry, past president of the U.S. Society of Rheology. He's been on a number of advisory boards for uh, both Dow, BASF, and Rheometrics uh, Scientific, Inc., so um, very widely with the industry. Um, He's received a number of awards, uh, the, the most notable of which I would say is the NSF Presidential Young Investigator Award, but he's also received a number of uh, distinguished lecturer and uh, visiting scholar awards from a variety of different institutions, including um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, University of Wisconsin, uh, the Midland Macromolecular Institute, and the University of Florida. So he's, he's very widely appreciated. Um, he's the, been the organizer and chair of the Gordon Conference on uh, Iron Containing Polymers and the Society of Petroleum Engineers Forum on Stimulation and Fluid Rheology, in addition to organizing a variety of different sessions for a number of different professional organizations. He directed the Princeton University, and sorry, Princeton University of Minnesota and Iowa State NSF Nanoscale Interdisciplinary Research Team Center on Nanoparticle Formation. Um, and his research interests are, are broadly across rheology and self-assembly of complex fluids, but in particular, his systems of interest are biopolymer solutions, gels, surfactant mesophases, polymer and surfactant mixtures. And so I, I, having given him that very lengthy introduction, uh, the general talk that he was going to give today is on nanoparticles for drug delivery to the lungs. And as you can see, he's going to be more specific from the title that's up there. So welcome, Bob. So it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I guess the evaluation sheets you can fill out and decide whether you ever want to hear me again. That's sort of daunting to a speaker to uh, start with that. Um, my interaction with RTI have been longstanding and enjoyable. I worked with uh, the group doing cement uh, work and part of our, my rheology hat, and uh, Tony and I uh, worked together on TB, aerosol delivery under a Gates grant a number of years ago, and we're sort of re-initiating uh, what that ought to look like. And so uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm sure I will come back. My daughter uh, and son-in-law actually uh, live here in Raleigh-Durham. She's on the medical school faculty, though they live in Kenya and do research on malaria. So um, what I'll talk about today is work we've been doing in the last uh, number of years on nanoparticle assembly, and I've titled it Facile Production of Multifunctional Nanoparticles for Difficult-to-Deliver Therapeutics. So hydrophobic drugs, peptides, and sRNA. And uh, we got into this from a discussion uh, about, again, a dozen years ago, one of the vice presidents of Pfizer came and said that a key problem they saw was bioavailability. That is, 40% of new drug compounds were hydrophobic and difficult to deliver. And so um, that motivates, motivated a lot of our early work early on. And then also, there's EPR and targeting for solid tumors, that is, especially for cancer therapies, the, the compounds are highly toxic, and so you want them to be delivered to the site of interest, whether it's cancer, whether it's TB, to avoid off-site toxicity. Um, and so in targeting, you also want multiple drugs to be delivered. So if you go, unfortunate enough to go into the hospital and have cancer or HIV, you're not given a single drug, you're always given a cocktail to try to hit multiple metabolic pathways. 
And from a nanoparticle, there were no strategies to allow you to deliver multiple compounds with the right time evolution to get synergy uh, from nanoparticles. And that was a major, again, driver for us. And finally, imaging and uh, delivery. That is, uh, in part of the targeting work I'll talk about today, if you're trying to target a particle uh, in vivo, it's not just I put this targeting agent on, I hope it went where I wanted it to go. You really need to couple that with imaging to say, did it go where I wanted it to go, and did it avoid nonspecific uh, off-target consequences? So to being able to, to uh, combine drug therapy delivery with imaging, with targeting, uh, was also a motivation. But in all of these, you'll see it's more than just small. So it's surface functionality. <clears throat> uh, if you want things small, you can mill them, and grind down drug crystals to get small things. But for all of the things I've talked about before, it's a combination of we want surface functionality, so these things can, can either be targeted or can be long circulating for enhanced permeation uh, uh, delivery. We want <clears throat> stoichiometric encapsulation of multiple species, so I can do drug cocktails from nanoparticle, and I want targeting plus delivery. And then most importantly, we want scalability and manufacturability. This is a nice quote from CNE News. Over the next few years, some of the complex theranostic strategies, theranostic is combining delivery plus imaging, um, ra published rampantly in chemistry journals will fall out of contention. For me, something that's too difficult to make or too complex to make uh, to sustain in large-scale production is not what we're interested in. And that's our philosophy, too. I mean, I've been a consultant with startup companies, and this one had a, a science paper. They were sure they could cure cancer. They got $25 million in venture capital. The venture capitalists were sure they could cure cancer. Uh, after six months, they realized they could not make these particles at scale. There was no way to, to make this into a scalable product. And so they abandoned that whole approach, went in another direction, uh, didn't give back the venture capital money. And after that, a couple of years, they failed completely. But so this issue of uh, can I make these complicated particles in a way that really can have an impact on medical health by being scalable? is what motivates us, and it'll be the focus of what I'll talk about today. So here's what we're going to cover. So I just went through why nanoparticles, the uh, kinds of reasons that you want to make nanoparticles, and now I'll talk about how we make them in this block copolymer directed rapid precipitation process we've developed. And I'm not going to go through all of the chemical engineering fluid mechanic details of that. That would be a talk for another audience. And so we've done a lot of uh, computational fluid mechanics, modeling, and uh, chemical modeling of reaction time scales in these things, which I won't cover today. But I'll just say basically it's about mixing. It's about how you do rapid solvent exchanges. And then the role of block copolymers in protecting these particles we're forming. And then I'll just briefly show you how we control particle size. And then the second part, or the third part of the talk, will be on controlled release from nanoparticles. How do you control the release of materials, especially for sustained release? You have something very hydrophobic and you just want to make it release faster, well, you put a nanoparticle form, you increase surface area, and you can increase the release kinetics, and that may be all you want. But if you're going to target something to a cancer tumor and you want sustained release, you need it to be in the particle while it's trying to find a cancer tumor. And if it releases too early, then whether it targets or not is irrelevant if you've lost all your payload. So you need to have something where we can tune the release kinetics independent of the targeting. And then multifunctional, I've just mentioned why we want to both uh, be able to see where things go as well as deliver things. And then we'll talk about targeting. So uh, here's our process. If you understand this, you understand sort of the concept of what we're doing. It's a block copolymer directed rapid precipitation. If I want to make things <coughs> um, uniformly, then what I want to do is I need uniform size. I need to start everything at one time and I need to stop everything at one time. If you're doing an anionic polymerization, you initiate all the polymerizations at one time and you stop all the polymerization at a later time. That controls the molecular weight. Well, for us, the start is the first part of this. Um, I have a, a tablet that I write on where it would go on both screens. We couldn't quite get the, the IT to, to make this work, so I've got to pick one screen to do a pointer on. And uh, unfortunately, the room is equally divided, so I'll do it over here. And those of you, sorry about the other side of the room. But here we go. Yeah, they're both equally same screens. Okay, so here's the start process. What we do, we bring in our solutes of interest, the drugs image, imaging agents, in a water miscible solvent. This can be ethanol, acetone, DMSO, THF, any number of water miscible organic solvents into which we can dissolve these hydrophobic components. And the small block copolymer. So it has a hydrophobic block, has a hydrophilic block. 
So that comes in on one stream, and then we're going to use these confined impinging jet mixers, which I'll describe, and the non-solvent is just water. So what we're doing is going from a system which is completely dissolved, and then in a millisecond and a half of the micro-mixing in this chamber, the system will go from being all the hydrophobic components happy to be dissolved to suddenly being in water, and they don't like being in water. They're diffusing, and they're so uh, supersaturated that the first thing they hit, they stick to. Okay, and that's the key here. Is, so we have the micro-mixing. What's coming out is this now essentially aqueous mixture, which has in it the hydrophobic solutes, the block of polymer. I've separated them in space, but of course they're intimately mixed in space. They're diffusing around. It's sticking to the first thing it sees. So the hydrophobic solute components are aggregating into larger and larger objects. The block of polymer is absorbing on those objects as they diffuse around. The polymer chains are also hitting each other and fusing and making micelles, polymeric micelles. So there are two different time scales here. There's a time scale of aggregation and growth of the core, or hydrophobic core, and a time scale associated with the micellization of those polymers as they diffuse around and hit. We need to balance those time scales, and that's something chemical engineers are pretty good at, is sort of competitive time scales. So what you want to have happen is when there is enough pol polymer absorbed on that surface, it will stop particle-particle aggregation. So the start process is micromixing. The stop process is having absorbed enough polymer on the surface that the steric layer prevents further aggregation. We want, um, so if this process, micellization is too fast, then what you end up with is forming micelles. There's not enough polymer to sterically stabilize the particles, and they will grow without bounds. Or if this process is too slow, these particles just grow way too big before you've absorbed enough polymer on them to stop aggregation. So con controlling those two timescales is how we control the particle size. We also want polymers here, which are uh, so hydrophobic that once they attach to the surface, they never come off. So things like surfactants don't work because even though you may be able to make a stable particle in vitro, when you put this in an animal what, or a person, what happens? That thing partitions on and off. And so it will leave the particle unprotected, and it'll end up, therefore, destabilizing the particle. Things you might think of like pleuronic polymers or surfactants, if you're familiar with those, those are polyethylene oxide, polypropylene oxide. They don't work because even though you can make nice particles in vitro, they have a relatively high solubility. They're coming on and off the particle all the time. And so in vivo, they will partition off and leave the particle unprotected. So we want things that are big enough that once they are absorbed, they're irreversibly captured and they never come off. And we'll describe a few of those polymers a little later. So this is the range of particle size that we can conveniently cover. Uh, the top one is uh, 450 nanometers mean size. Everything is within one decade of size, which is narrow in this sort of field. And we see we have six times more drug or contents than block of polymer. So the loading that we are able to get with this is much higher than the loading that most people get in the nanoparticle field, where 2 to 3 to 4 percent is normal for most loadings of hydrophobic materials in PLGA particles, for example. Um, if we change the supersaturation, here we end up with 88 nanometer particles. Importantly, nothing is above 0.2 microns, so you can take this and put this through a 0.22 micron filter and it's sterile, and that's a big deal for a lot of our, our collaborators, industrial collaborators, to be able to form and post-sterilize these, especially if you're looking at biologics that you don't want to put through heat treatment for sterilization. Uh, we have a little bit of excess polymer, a block of polymer in this one, and those are free micelles that are formed. So we had a little more polymer than we needed. So this size range of about 50 nanometers up to about 500 nanometers is where we can conveniently get with this technology. I also, just for this general audience, want to uh, define some terms and show you what we're doing differently than what other people do or what other technologies, because the word nano medicine covers lots of sins and good stuff, too. Uh, but here are different constructs for what we're talking about. Surfactant micelles, and these are all drawn to size scale here. So a surfactant micelle with a, uh, whether it's a uh, non-ionic surfactant or an SDS molecule, are about four nanometers in size. The red with a pacotaxel molecule, that's a size scale of that relative to the micelles. You can fit a few, couple of pacotaxel molecules and a cancer drug in a micelle. However, the surfactants are partitioning on and off of that uh, in microsecond timescales, and so the pacotaxel is not really protected in any sense. The micelle is a dynamic object. Polymeric micelles 
are in the size range of 20 to 40 nanometers. <clears throat> and the loading of those is always very low. That is, the way these are made, people will try to load a drug into the core, the hydrophobic core of this polymeric micelle. And when you're doing that, it's like trying to put water in a sponge. There's only so much capacity for imbibing the hydrophobic drug into this hydrophobic polymer uh, core that you make. Um, and that's driven by just classical Flory Huggins theory. You can predict the amount of drug which will be solubilized into the core. And these numbers are always, as I said, quite low, a couple to 10 to maybe 15 percent, uh, because you're trying to imbibe the drug into a core. Uh, liposomes are widely used for drug delivery, and they're great for soluble species because, of course, the center of the liposome is an aqueous environment, so you can encapsulate sRNA or soluble drugs into that. But it's a terrible vehicle for hydrophobic drugs because the only hydrophobic volume you have is that small volume of the lipid bilayer. So you get very low uh, volume and therefore encapsulation uh, efficiency or encapsulation amount with liposomes. What we're doing is a classic precipitation. So we end up with high concentrations of drug because it's precipitation and then in a protecting or encapsulation. So that's why we're able to get high loadings and we're in this size range that we want for uh, drug delivery, which is usually about 80 to about 100 nanometers. So just to, to uh, when you hear the word nano, just to think what we're doing is a little different than what a lot of people are doing in this field. Uh, this one, which isn't projecting well, is uh, just a schematic of kinds of drugs that we've worked with or kinds of things we've worked with. So we'll sort of, won't go all of these in the talk, but uh, beta carotene is a, uh, a nice model compound. Your body hydrolyzes it to vitamin A. Uh, estradiol, that's vitamin E. This is a pacotaxel cancer drug. That's rifampicin, a TB drug. This is a diaminopyridine, which is a nerve agent blocker. Uh, we've done, I'll show you various peptides and sRNA that, although hydrophilic, we can transform them into hydrophobic components that we can precipitate in this technology. So it's, it applies to lots of different things. It's not chemically specific. Here are the block polymers. We can use lots of different block polymers because it's not really a chemistry issue. It's a polymer physics. So what do we want? We want a hydrophobic end that's big enough that it stays anchored. We want a hydrophilic group, which is big enough that it pro provides this dense steric layer that prevents protein adsorption, because that's how most clearance occurs, is by protein adsorption and then optimization. The system recognizes this as something that a protein is stuck to and so it's supposed to be cleared. Um, the hydrophobic group can be anything from polystyrene to uh, polybutyl uh, acrylate. Most of our collaborators in the medical field want to use biocompatible things, which in fact will ultimately hydrolyze away over a period of about a month. So polycaprolactones, polylactic acid materials will give you the hydrophobic anchoring block that will, will finally hydrolyze away. The hydrophilic blocks are, can be polyacrylic acid, but most of what we use is polyethylene glycol. That's a standard way of passivating or making a stale surface because uh, proteins will not adsorb on that dense pig layer. Molecular weights here, uh, the PEG molecular weight, and we'll show you data in a minute, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 molecular weight. And the anchoring uh, size is anywhere from usually about 1.5 K to maybe 7 or 8 K. Again, we don't want huge polymers because we want these things to be able to diffuse rapidly to get to the surface in the assembly process. So we don't want great big chains. We want small chains. But we want things with big enough hydrophobes they stay anchored. So here's a schematic of the mixer. Um, what we have, I said, it's called confined impinging jets. So we have these two streams that are impinging on each other. Uh, so one would be the organic stream, one would be the aqueous stream. These are the highest energy mixers you can get. They're much higher energy than rotor stator mixers, much higher than turbulent flow in a pipe, uh, because you're taking all of this inertia and annihilating it as turbulence. This is not microfluidics. Microfluidics are horrible mixers because you have laminar flow, and if I have a 100 micron channel in a microfluidics device, um, the diffusion time goes as a length squared. We end up in a millisecond and a half. The, the turbulence you get in the mixing of these streams causes the striations to be about a micron in, in thickness, and that gives you a millisecond and a half diffusion time, because all we're trying to diffuse is water and THF. And so we get very rapid mixing. If you go to that 100 micron uh, microfluidics channel, that's four orders of magnitude slower mixing than we get with the turbulent micromixers. So we spend a lot of time engineering this, and it's not. Uh, and also, these are uh, the microfluidics devices are really not scalable. But in this, <clears throat> we can make samples as small as 
now about a milligram of material up to, if we run this continuously, we can get 3.5 kilograms per day out of our lab. So it's the fact that this is scalable because it's a continuous flow process um, is really important. And we can make the same materials at this milligram scale as a kilogram scale. And BASF uses this to make 1,400 kilograms per day of 100 nanometer beta carotene salmon food. So the fact that BASF can, can make the beta carotene, put it in this 100 nanometer form, cheaply enough to throw it in the ocean to feed salmon, says this is intrinsically a cheap process. Okay, why does BASF do that? If you go to the store and buy farm salmon, the flesh is nice and red, okay? Uh, Ocean-going salmon, real salmon, uh, are red because they're eating crustaceans, shrimp, and, and things in the ocean, and picking up the carotenoids and col coloring their, their flesh. Farm salmon, if you feed them just trout protein, their flesh is white like a trout, and people don't like that. They expect their salmon to be red. And so BASF and, uh, has a very large market, the largest market for carotenoids, is to take these beta carotene, which has a log P of 9, very, very hydrophobic. It's so hydrophobic, if you have it as 1 or 10 micron crystals, not enough of it dissolves in the four hours through the salmon's gut to color the, the flesh red. So you have to put it down in 100 nanometer particles to make enough bioavailable to color the salmon's flesh. Okay? So in the supermarket, you're eating, it, you're eating carrots. So it's all good. You know, beta carotene is color in carrots. So you're not doing anything bad for yourself. Uh, it's just the fact that, um, we, again, this is scalable to that scale from milligrams to thousands of kilograms per day in the same device. And the scale up is because the flow rate goes as pressure drop to the radius cubed of these orifices. So if I go from, we work at 17 PSI. Uh, so these are glass syringes. This is not a 10,000 PSI microfluidics device where you're using tremendous energy to try ripping emulsions apart. All we're trying to do is to engineer turbulence so that we get this millisecond and a half diffusion time. And so if you go from 17 to uh, 100 or 1,000 PSI BSF operates, so that gives you that 10, 100 fold increase in rate, and then you go from 250 micron orifices to a millimeter orifice, so a very modest scale up, and you get 64 times. So quickly, in a bank of three of these, BSF can make this 1,000 kilograms per day of 100 nanometer particles. So the scalability and the inexpense of this process is crucial. Um, now I'll just go through control of particle size real quickly. What controls that, whether we make 88 nanometer or 450 nanometer particles? And there are really uh, two parts to that. The first part is mixing, and whoops. Uh, I don't want to do any of that. There we go. Okay. So what's shown here is particle size. This is a beta carotene sample, actually, and this is Reynolds number, which is the jet velocities. If we do very poor mixing, we end up with large nonspecific aggregates, and so that's they're too big. If we go up in mixing speed you reach a mixing speed at which now the particle size is independent of the mixing speed. So going to higher energy or velocity doesn't give you smaller particles. All you're doing is having the solvent exchange process be faster than that diffusion-limited aggregation process. So once you're past that, then the molecular diffusion is independent of the average velocity in the flow. Okay, so for all of these then, when I'm above, in this case, a Reynolds number of about 300 or jet velocities, that the, uh, same, we make the same particle size. And that's why this process is not really sensitive to the velocity of the jets once you're operating in this region. What's the difference between these four data sets have to do with supersaturation. So what we've done here is we've changed the solvent quality. So now in the, the uh, top most, the beta carotene has the highest solubility. That means the supersaturation is lowest after micromixing, which means the nucleation rate is slower Slower nucleation rate means you have fewer nuclei, and having fewer nuclei means that beta carotene accumulates on those fewer number of nuclei, and so the average size is 200 nanometers. If we go to higher supersaturations, that means the nucleation rate goes up because the supersaturation is higher. I have more nuclei, so the beta carotene accumulates on that greater number of nuclei, so the average size is smaller, so we get down here at about 60 nanometers. Okay, so changing supersaturation, which changes nucleation rate, is the main way of controlling particle size. Well, the polymer makes a difference, uh, but it's a relatively modest difference. So this is particle size, and this is the concentration of polymer, and these are for two different supersaturations, actually. If we have enough polymer, 
then adding more polymer doesn't make things smaller. So it's not like a surfactant dissolving in oil, where if I put more surfactant in there, I'm going to get smaller and smaller particle sizes. What happens is that polymer absorbs, accumulates on the surface until that head layer, that peg layer, is densely packed. And at that point, no more polymer can absorb. And so now the excess polymer you add goes off to form those micelles I showed you. So once you have, have saturated the surface, adding more polymer doesn't help. It just makes more micelles, which are not helpful in the process. Okay, so um, it's controlled mainly by the supersaturation nucleation rate and not primarily by the polymer. The polymer is crucial for stopping aggregation, but it's not setting the polymer, it's not setting the nanoparticle size. But the polymer makes a big difference in the in vivo uh, uh, application of these. What happens when you put them in an animal? So what's shown here are a series of blockopolymers. And this is the circulation time in an animal. This is research done in collaboration with Celator Pharmaceuticals. And they were interested at that point in we're delivering pacotaxel. And what polymer should we use uh, to deliver this pacotaxel in, in animals or in their final clinical trials? And so uh, we have two different kinds here, polycaprolactone. These are all polycaprolactone hydrophobic groups. That's polystyrene. And let's look start here. So these are 2,000 molecular weight PEG and 3,000 molecular weight polycaprolactone. And this is 5,000 molecular weight 2,000, 3,000 molecular weight polycaprolactone. What you see is the, the uh, smaller peg block is cleared much more rapidly. So it's not a thick enough, dense enough layer to prevent protein adsorption and things are cleared. So a bigger peg layer is better at preventing protein adsorption and clearance. So that's the first lesson. Uh, but now let's look at the molecular weight of, the, of that polycaprolactone block. So this now goes from This is 3K, 7K, 9K. And you think, well, does the system bigger hydrophobic block better? And the answer is no. What we see is the bigger hydrophobic block clears much more rapidly. And the 3K is best. Now, you can't go below 3K because now the anchoring energy isn't great enough for it to stay locked on the surface. But why is the bigger hydrophobe worse? What's happening is that bigger hydrophobe is occupying more area at the nanoparticle surface relative to that peg chain. And if I occupy too much area at the surface, then proteins can absorb at that uh, less well peg protected surface. The winner here is actually a polystyrene. Uh, a 2K, uh, 3K polystyrene, I'm sorry, a 3K peg, a 2.7K peg, 1.6K polystyrene. And that gives, after 24 hours, you have 80% of the material is still circulating the animal. Why is that so good? It's so good because polystyrene is actually much more hydrophobic than polycaprolactone. And so it gives you a better anchoring energy, which causes, lets the peg chains be forced more together. You get a, a more dense peg layer. Uh, Celator is actually going into uh, their trials with the polystyrene material because of this greater circulation ability, even though the polystyrene is not going to be biodegradable. So it's a, a trade-off they've made. And they're convinced that these very small polystyrene fragments are not going to be toxic or have any long-term consequences. Okay, so the blockopolymer block length makes a difference uh, to what happens to these things in circulation. So we've gone through mixing, we've gone through control of particle size, now let's look at controlled release. Uh, and I'm going to give you a series of examples of things we've worked on. The first one was Larry Kiefer at NIH on diazinium dilates. Uh, Larry heard me give a talk at an ACS meeting, came up afterwards, and he said, uh, there are these amazing things called NO, nitrous oxide, which does all sorts of things in biology. And uh, you can tune it so it will drive cells towards apoptotic uh, pathways and kill cancer cells. It also is a really strong vasodilator. So you give NO and the, the uh, capillaries and veins expand. And so the problem Larry was having was anytime they gave this NO at doses that would be therapeutically effective, the blood pressure on the mouse dropped so much that they died. Okay. So he needed something to uh, control the release or keep these, the NO from being released too early so it could be delivered to the cancer tumor. And they, what Larry had made in their group at NIH was a series of diazinium dilates, which are shown in the cartoons here. They're prodrugs, and they're attacked by glutathione by this mechanism to release the two NO molecules. So they're really interesting materials. He was having a hard time delivering because they were too hydrophobic, but that's exactly what we want for our nanoparticles. We want things that are really hydrophobic. Um, so they, in fact, make very nice nanoparticles, 100, 200 nanometer particles, 
uh, directly without any further modification. And then in the animal studies, this shows the NO release rates. If you take his NO prodrugs uh, as initially uh, just the prodrug itself in DMSO, inject it, and look at the NO release rates within uh, you know, 25 minutes, you've lost all the NO. The release is way too fast. In our protected nanoparticle, you can see the half times here are about 120 minutes. And so that gives you enough time to, in fact, administer these things. And then the, the cancer tumor study showed that these were effective. Okay, so what we've done is by putting things in the core, we control their bioavailability and keep them from being, keep the, allow them to circulate, keep them from being cleared. Um, Amgen brought us this problem. They were interested in, in peptides and biologics. And as you probably all know, there's a tremendous uh, resurgence, not resurgence, a tremendous acceleration of interest in biologics in the pharmaceutical world. People want to be able to deliver these because being larger molecules, they can interact more strongly with, with biological sites and be more specific than small molecule drugs. Um, Amgen had these series of peptides uh, that they brought to us and said, can we deliver them? Because if you take these peptides and just put them in circulation, they're immediately enzymatically cleaved. You know, our body has enzymatic mechanisms for clearing junk that's floating around. It doesn't want strange peptides and proteins to be floating around, so it's enzymatically cleared. So you have to be able to protect these if you're trying to deliver a therapeutic. So uh, this particular peptide sequence, the series they gave us were a series with different hydrophobicity. If it's too hydrophilic, of course, it can't be encapsulated by our technique, but we now have a technique for doing soluble biologics that um, I won't cover here, but I'm glad to talk with anyone, so we can now deliver soluble biologics at 50% uh, loading in a way that no one else can. So that's another talk. Uh, this peptide is relatively hydrophobic, and you can make really nice 100 nanometer particles by this direct precipitation. And the, one of the other peptides is called bombasin. It's a, a natural product, again, used as in a commercial uh, therapeutic application. And this was really interesting what happened. So you do the initial precipitation, and what you see is a 30 nanometer nanoparticles that are formed. So you do this and do the light scattering immediately, and you see you have 30 nanometer things. And then over time, 20 minutes and 30 minutes, this peak goes down, and that peak goes up at about a micron. So it's unstable, but it's unstable in a very specific way. Most instability is I made particles and they just aggregated non-specifically to big junk that falls to the bottom of the test tube. This is not a non-specific aggregation. This is a rearrangement to a new object, which is, a, a, for this particular case, a thousand nanometers in size. So what's going on? Why does this go away and what happens? And why does that stop at a thousand nanometers? Um, so working with a simulator in our department, Thanos Panatopoulos and a postdoc, they did this molecular dynamic simulation, and this box shows a box which has um, the blockopolymer and a hydrophobic drug molecule where we, we, they have matched the PEG uh, molecular dynamics interaction potentials with, with PEG to give the right radius of gyration of that chain, and the hydrophobic blocks uh, of that polymer, we're changing that interaction potential with the hydrophobic solute, which is precipitating. So it's a coarse grain molecular dynamics. The solute and block of polymer are simulated with five hydrophobic beads and eight hydrophilic beads. The box has 500 polymer chains and 1,000 sol solute molecules. And then the solvent quenching is represented by temperature uh, quenching to initiate aggregation in the simulation. And here are the two papers where this appeared. What you find in that simulation and what explains what we see in that uh, the population of those particles is if the binding energy is very high between the hydrophobic block of the polymer and the solute which makes those, then the particle is well covered by these peg chains. So it's well stabilized. And if you do the radial distribution function, that is the spacing between uh, the hydrophobic blocks on this nanoparticle surface, you can see it's a bit flat. It's the same everywhere. So that makes a nice stable particle. However, if you decrease this energy and have here something where the energy between the hydrophobic block and the nanoparticle surface is weaker, then the block of polymer forms micelles. That is, the block of polymer hydrophobic block hydrophobic block interaction dominates, and you form micelles. And on the surface, you form clusters. That is, these things hit on the surface and move so that the hydrophobic blocks are all in an aggregate, and you have wide spaces here which are not protected. What that does is those unprotected spaces then allow particle-particle aggregation, 
and you grow these things up until you finally have full surface coverage of these hydrophobic blocks on the surface. And this is a process which is called pickering emulsions. If you're at all in this field, uh, this is exactly the way that people make well-controlled emulsion sizes by having a few stabilizing units making very small droplets and letting them re-aggregate up to dense packing on the surface. And that's basically what we've done here. And so this one micron size was the size at which you aggregate these until now on these bigger particles because of surface to volume, that is I have less surface area per volume, so I've aggregated lots of small things, I actually have less surface area here than individually those particles had. So I concentrate these islands on the surface till they're close packed and then that stops aggregation. Okay, so this tells us something interesting about anchoring energies and what, how we want to engineer that for these nanoparticles. And the last thing I'll give you is work we did with Merck. Uh, they came to us and said, uh, sRNA delivery is a really big thing. And uh, they wanted to know what our technique allow them to produce these at scale. And of course, you all know sRNA is water soluble. But the way it's delivered, one of the two, um, well, there are really three competing technologies now for delivery. One is to, to electrostatically complex the sRNA with a cationic polymer and to make a small particle. Uh, that, I think, is universally recognized at this point as a bad idea because those cationic polymers are always cytotoxic. So it's a great way to do in, in, vivo, in vitro tests in labs, but it will never transition to, to therapy. Um, the Merck strategy and Anilum, uh, who are the two leaders in this field, um, <clears throat> use this strategy. That is, you take a cationic lipid and that cationic lipid is a histidine, so it has a pKa of 5.2, and therefore at low pH it's cationic, but at pH 7 it's no longer cationic. You mix that with the sRNA, and then you put some part of that lipid component that has a 2K peg tail on it. So you mix these all together, and they age into this nanoparticle over a 24-hour period. Um, this is done at, I said, at low pH, so the this cationic lipid attaches to the negatively charged sRNA, and this makes it an electrostatic complex. And the question is, under rapid precipitation, could we form this, and you do not need this 24-hour aging to do it? And in fact, it works beautifully. Uh, here are 100 nanometer particles, or 80 nanometer particles we make by the rapid precipitation with the lipid coming in in, the, in an uh, organic stream and the sRNA coming in the aqueous stream. The electrostatics is fast enough to form this uh, electrostatic complex, which is hydrophobic, to precipitate and to be protected by the, uh, uh, the peg chains and to form these particles. This was a, a relief to them because in doing this, their assays for whether they thought this was going to work in, in animal studies was to do cryo-TM on every sample they made. It was $500 a shot to analyze particle size for every, uh, and the morphology of the particles. And so to show that they didn't have to do this was important. Uh, at least it saved that group a lot of money. Um, okay, so those give me some examples of kinds of things we can can precipitate, make into nanoparticles. Now we'll talk about controlled release. So our concept here is to have the drug uh, in the in the core have it so hydrophobic it never leaves. However, you of course want the drugs to leave. How do we get them to leave? We used a, an idea that's been longstanding in the pharmaceutical community, and that's do pro drugs. But virtually everyone else in this pro drug world had taken the drug and it linked it to something hydrophilic, like a peg chain or an albumin, something to take this relatively hydrophobic drug and to make it more soluble so they could dissolve it. We're doing just the reverse. We're going to link it to something hydrophobic to make it less soluble so it stays partitioned in the core, and then we're going to release it by having a linker here which cleaves in a controlled way, and so now the drug release is controlled not by the intrinsic hydrophobicity of the drug, but by the cleavage kinetics of that linker. What this allows us to do is to do drug cocktails and to have two different drugs with the same linker. And so the cleavage kinetics is the same even though these two drugs have different intrinsic solubilities or performance. And so this allows us to do drug cocktails. And this is Stellator Technologies uh, technology to do this. Um, <clears throat> the linkages we use uh, most commonly are a hydrolytically unstable ones, so you can do uh, esters, you can do orthoesters and ketals, uh, sorry, esters, orthoesters and ketals, you can do silanol groups, Tom Hoy, University of Minnesota, part of our NERD was doing that, and you can link to 
hydroxyls on virtually any drug that's of interest. There'll be a hydroxyl somewhere where you can link this ester to and create these prodrugs. So this is the pacotaxel, and this is rifampicin. We'll show you in a little later. And this is the re results of those studies. So here is the uh, drug in circulation. So this is how much nanoparticles are still circulating in the animal. Uh, and then, so it's being, the pacotaxel is now being cleaved off and released in circulation. These are different hydrophobic anchors we use and different linkage kinetics, linkers, which change the kinetics. And what you see here is that depending on the hydrophobicity and the linker, we can have release kinetics that go from a few minutes to a uh, half-time release in 24 hours. So we can tune this release rate sort of anywhere you want based on the chemistry. Um, this was, in fact, not the most therapeutically effective one. And the reason for that is if it's releasing the drug too slowly, there's not enough high, high enough concentration to be therapeutically active. Pack a tax on its own, and even though you can make a nice stable nanoparticle in vitro, you put an animal, and in 20 minutes, one of these curves here is pure pack a taxel, it's gone. So it partitions to albumin, which is the abraxane, uh, idea or petitions to lipoproteins or red blood cells, and it's just no longer in your nanoparticle. Uh, the most therapeutically effective was one in this center band here, which has about a four-hour release time, which is what people know from the liposome world in enhanced permeation retention. That is, that's the time scale for these 60, 80 nanometer particles to diffuse through the leaky vasculature here in tumors and embed themselves in the tumor and to be targeted by this passive permeation retention mechanism. So that four-hour time frame was most effective. Um, now let's talk about multifunctional particles and imaging. <clears throat> in almost all of our collaborations in our work, uh, we want to know where the particles are and what concentration there are. So there are a number of ways to do that. A simple way is you just uh, use fluorescence. As you know, most fluorescent dyes people use in biochemistry or molecular biology are, are soluble species, alexafluors, things like that. Um, <clears throat> And that's fine if you're trying to do something soluble. We want it to be in the core, so we want a very hydrophobic material. So it stays in the core, and it, therefore we can follow the fate of the nanoparticle, not something that partitions out. You can take something like coumarin, which is water-soluble, and link it to vitamin A, and you can make these 100 nanometer particles. And this uh, is a LHRH uh, targeted, a peptide targeted nanoparticle going into a breast cancer cell line. The green are our nanoparticles, so they've been internalized into these. Uh, breast cancer cells and endosomes in the cells and, and are then released. The red is, is, is a DRAC staining of the nucleus. They don't go in the nucleus, they go in the cytosol. So this is the kind of normal way we do tracking. So you can take a small amount of the fluorescent material, put it with your therapeutic agent, and precipitate it into the core of the nanoparticles. Our favorite dye at this point is uh, John Anthony, University of Kentucky, has made these series of what are called penicines. <clears throat> And these were initially made for the photovoltaic world. And you say, what do you want for photovoltaics? Well, you want something that can stand, you can paint on the roof or on your solar panel. It sits outside in the sunlight for 20 years. It doesn't degrade, and it gives you good conversion. OK, so light conversion. <clears throat> and so what do we want for biological imaging? We want something that doesn't photo bleach. And we want something really hydrophobic. So on a, on a roof solar panel, you want something hydrophobic. It doesn't wash off. Most biologists don't want hydrophilic things. They want things that will wash off. So these are perfect for us. <clears throat> They're extremely hydrophobic. They're very photostable. Uh, at this version of it, the next one, the next longer wavelength is not so photostable, but these are very photostable. Um, and we now put these in the nanoparticles at about 2.3 weight percent. This is the fluorescence per nanoparticle, and this is concentration. If you go to too high a concentration, you get foster energy transfer and quenching. Uh, but 2.3% gives you the maximum uh, fluorescence per particle. And this shows uh, that was uh, injection into a uh, tumor in a mouse, and so we can do uh, IVUS imaging with these particles. So they're photostable. They're non-quenching. Uh, you go to this maximum. They're very hydrophobic. They have 67% quantum yields. So they're quite efficient. And the emissions are between 650 and 750. So this strong emission is about 650 which is a little too short for some of the whole animal imaging that we're now doing, but that's a dye we often use. Um, in everything I've talked to you so far, we've had a hydrophobic organic compound that we've precipitated, but there's nothing in our strategy that says it has to be an organic compound. It just has to be hydrophobic, so in water it will diffuse and stick. So Marion Gindy, my really talented grad student, 
uh, said, let's try taking gold particles and putting a hydrophobic uh, thiol, decane thiol on the surface to make them hydrophobic and put it through the precipitation process and see what happens. Well, you put it through this precipitation as a block copolymer and you can make clusters of gold particles. Uh, this is in TM, so you don't see the peg surrounding uh, corona, but these are peg protected and long circulating and colloidally stable. So this would be of interest as an X-ray contrast agent, uh, these gold particles. And uh, you can also now co-incorporate in these gold particles. This is rifampicin, a TB drug. And so this is a material without any organic. This is with rifampicin, so it makes slightly larger particles here. This, the small black dots are those gold particles, and people in the X-ray community say they could see this. That's a high enough density of gold that they could see these nanoparticles in animal imaging. So we can deliver organics and, uh, and imaging agents. A more interesting one is actually to take small colloidal 15 nanometer cobalt ferrite colloids. These are super paramagnetic oxide ones. You coat them with hydrophobic materials, precipitate them, and now we've made an MRI imaging agent. So this shows a, uh, a gelatin well, and here are different concentrations, and you get very good MRI signals. This is the relaxivity, this is iron concentration, and DAR particles are in the same relaxivity spectrum as commercial materials, which are sold as imaging agents. In addition to MRI, we can do uh, radiation-based detection. This is SPEC. So we have our block polymer. We take a hydrophobic block and put a chelating ligand that can be uh, DPTA or DFO, any number of these agents with complex specific metal ions, the copper for DPTA, zirconium for DFO. Our strategy is to have the, the chelating agent on a, the end of a small linker so it's buried down inside the corona because we don't want it to be this big charge chelator to be seen by the biological system. So we keep it near the core. Uh, and have the longer peg chains out there for steric stabilization and targeting. And this just shows some mouse images here where we've added, in this case, an indium chelated into this DPTA, and uh, we can do spec imaging on animals. With UPEN, we're doing PET imaging. It's a little different uh, setting this modality up. Turns out that the uh, on PET imaging, positron emission tomography, you, one of the standard ways of doing it is to do an iodination reaction on a phenol. Normally, it's done on tyrosine on antibodies, and you put it through this oxidation reaction, and you put an iodine on here adjacent to the hydroxyl, and the iodine is the radioactive uh, agent, and that does PET imaging. Well, we were talking to the group at UPenn, and we said, well, there are actually polymers used as photoresists that would have this structure, and I bet we could make them into particles, and then we could do the iodination reaction just as you do now, so we're not changing your setup at all for doing iodination. And sure enough, we can make nanoparticles, dose the iodination, and this is Anne-Marie Chaco putting a targeting uh, antibody on the surfaces of those. And then here's the animal study. So this is the x-ray to give you sort of uh, image of the overall animal, and here's the pet image. Uh, this is imaging the lungs, and the bottom is the liver. Uh, this is this uh, uh, antibody for targeting endothelial cells. This, they added a, a lipoprotein to cause irritation to uh, uh, exaggerate the inflammation in the lungs. You see you get more material here in the lungs. If you have an antibody which is not targeted to epithelial cells, it goes to the liver. It's cleared in the liver. So we can do PET imaging with these nanoparticles uh, effectively also. Um, in the, so now we'll end with the TB part of the story and uh, talk about specifically about targeting. And you all know the targeting story, and that is we have a nanoparticle. We're going to put something on it that wants to find a receptor and to be internalized so that it can be localized, the drug or the imaging agent in that cell. There's some really interesting fundamental science issues with targeting, which we can easily answer, and it's hard for a lot of other people to answer. And those will be schematically shown here. These two figures have exactly the same number of ligands uh, on, the, on that surface. That just happens to be shorter chains, and those are bigger chains. What's better? Okay, same, link, same density number on the nanoparticle. Well, you'd say maybe the bigger chain's better because it can reach out further on the surface and find more receptors more easily. So maybe that's better. However, the larger I make the polymer chain, the more dilute I make it in end groups because the main part of the chain occupies a big volume, and there's only one end. So is it better to use a big chain 
They can reach out or to smaller chains where the ends are actually more concentrated on the surface. Then this picture here is just showing the density. Do we want to go to a tremendously high density on the surface or not? And then this is, do we want the targeting chains to be on bigger chains so they stick out past the steric layer? And is that more effective at them finding the, the ligand density? Um, we, we're doing a lot on targeting now from small molecules, and I'll show you mannose targeting for TB, folate. Um, we've gone all the way to antibodies. For us, I think a really interesting region is right in here, single-chain antibody fragments. And the idea there is that um, antibodies are extremely expensive to make and difficult to do reproducibly. The single-chain fragments, basically the recognition fragment off that antibody, can be made at E. coli at three orders of magnitude less cost than making the full antibody. And you have control over it. So if we can put those on the surface of our nanoparticle, the question is, we will never get the same specificity as uh, a full antibody, because full antibody has the, the spacing and rigidity. It, even if we put these on two chains that have flexibility, they'll never, that entropy fights against you. So we'd never expect the binding constant to be as good as an antibody, but we actually don't need it to be as good as an antibody. We just need to be good enough. So here is uh, work we've done with uh, Johnson Johnson Janssen pharmaceuticals using these antibody fragments. These are 14,000 molecular weight materials. We can conjugate them to the chains and do all the hard chemistry and analysis on that and quantitatively package it into the nanoparticle. And this shows the uh, targeted versus untargeted uh, flow cytometry. This is just the confocal showing you the sort of green color is the targeted materials. So we can target fairly big things. And this is where we got started with, uh, with Tony, actually, and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates' grant to David Edwards at Harvard. And the concept was to do aerosol delivery of TB medicine so you would eliminate refrigeration and move this into third world countries. Um, after about two years, Gates changed. So we were interested in small molecule delivery. And, and there was a, a parallel path that was going to do uh, TB vaccines. Gates Foundation said, we only want to do vaccines, so we ended up being kicked to the side. Um, and then we made a collaboration with Sequela, which is a small startup company uh, doing TB drugs, and we continued that. And so this is, I'll tell you the story about the, that collaboration. Uh, so the idea in TB is that the TB bacillus has mannose groups on its surface, and so macrophages are tuned to say, I want anything I see with mannose must be a TB bacillus, especially if they've previously incorporated them, and therefore, if we take our nanoparticle and we put mannose on the surface, we can uh, specifically have it taken up into macrophages, which are have overexpressed mannose receptors. Um, once it's internalized, the TB bacillus takes over the mechanism, which normally should take it to a, a lysosome and should digest what it just ate. And the TB bacillus sort of hides in there in a resting metabolic state. And therefore, it's difficult to deliver drugs because you need to come from the aqueous environment through the macrophage membrane through the, the uh, lysosome membrane. And then the, t the mycobacteria have a really amazing shell coat, which has uh, aliphatic groups up to C60. So it's a much more hydrophobic uh, bacterial shell than in most things we work on. So you've got to go from this aqueous, hydrophobic, aqueous environment. And it's difficult to deliver compounds to that uh, through all those layers to the drug. So Sequela had this new compound they called SQ641. Uh, very hydrophobic. They couldn't deliver it, so they came to us. <clears throat> and it, we could make nanoparticles very easily out of it. So here is data done in their labs. So this is a uh, number of units, the control uh, here, uh, number of colonies, TB colonies after a seven-day incubation. We're dosing all of these at two times of MIC. <laughs> And so here's the control. This is I, uh, NIH, which or INH, which is the current first-line TB drug. Here is Sequela's drug in nanoparticle form, so it's more effective than the INH at knocking down the TB uh, counts. And then talking with uh, uh, the Sequela people, they said, we know that one of the problems with our SQ641 is it stimulates efflux pumps, and then it's pumped out of the mycobacteria. So we know that's a problem. Well, a year earlier, we'd worked with Kim Chan in Australia, and uh, Tony knows Kim, who's an aerosol person, and we had made 100 nanometer particles of cyclosporin A. Cyclosporin A is a known efflux pump blocker. 
So I knew we could make nanoparticles out of that. So what we did is we combined cyclosporin A and SQ641. Cyclosporin A in nanoparticle form on its own does something, but it's not really effective. But you put the SQ641 and cyclosporin A, and you triple the effectiveness of that. So being able to co-deliver the efflux pump blocker and the drug gave us a, a really effective formulation. At that point, Sequela's venture capital backers got them out of TB, and so uh, <clears throat> to more lucrative uh, infections, because TB is essentially a third world issue or uh, disease resistant issue for uh, classes of, of patients here in the U.S., which I think makes us, again, of interest. Um, this was work we did with rifampicin. So before we started the SQ641, rifampicin uh, is, again, a good first-line drug. It's relatively hydrophobic, but not hydrophobic enough to make nanoparticles. So you can conjugate it to either vitamin E, or, uh, which is shown here, or polycaprolactone, make it hydrophobic. Here is the uh, counts again. Here's the control. Here's INH in this case. Um, if we conjugate it to polycaprolactone, it's not very effective. It's so hydrophobic, it doesn't leave the nanoparticles. So again, you're just not delivering enough drug to make it useful. If we take rifampicin conjugated vitamin E, this, it's again not very effective because it doesn't release the rifampicin rapidly enough in this assay. Now, it may be the best thing you want to do in terms of long-term systemic release through an aerosol, but in this short one-day exposure on this test, it doesn't release enough. But if you take rifampicin conjugate and add to free rifampicin to one-to-one -one ratio, you get a much more effective formulation. So that free rifampicin, the conjugated rifampicin is allowing the free rifampicin to template it in the nanoparticle and give you a stable nanoparticle. And the free rifampicin can leave quickly. I think that the conjugated rifampicin will leave more slowly and would be an interesting long-term uh, therapy, which we just haven't had time to explore. So now let's look at targeting. So that's the drug delivery part of it. And I said the macrophages have mannose receptors are looking for mannose sites on uh, the mycobacteria to engulf. So what we do is we take our, in this case, a polystyrene peg. We put a click, an alkyne on that. We make the mannose here. We put an azid on that. You then do click chemistry. And now we have the blockopolymer peg with our targeting mannose on it. We make a series of particles. We can change particle size. Um, by changing the core in this case. So we make these series of particle sizes very rapidly. What's interesting here is this is a hydroxyl terminated peg and this is a methoxy terminated peg. So in the polymer science world, you say one group out of 104, so a 5K peg of 104 units, can't make much difference. It turns out it makes an enormous difference. And it was actually Jeff Hubble, I heard him give a talk several years ago, who pointed this out in terms of the uptake of, by macrophages in, in uh, lymphatic a drainage. And he found this big difference between peg change with OH versus peg with methoxy. And so sure enough, here is with methoxy, if we go to bigger particle size, the uptake into macrophages gets bigger and bigger as the particle gets bigger and bigger. The methoxy coated ones are completely inert. So they are invisible. So they're stealth material. So again, this shows you know, small changes in the nanochemistry world or nanotoxicology world, world, really small changes make huge differences in what happens to these things. So we're going to put methoxy groups on the peg. And now um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is change the percent of the peg which has mannose on it. Starting with zero here, that's pure peg, going up to 50% uh, coverage there. So in a morning, we can make this whole spectrum of materials because all we're doing is mixing neutral and mannose peg in a way that's difficult for most people who are doing post-conjugation to know what they've done, putting one mannose chain on a, th on a 100 nanometer particle, it's difficult to diagnose what you've really done. So this assembly process is helpful. Um, <clears throat> the, the black, let's see, the black ones are uh, the 5K um, peg neutral and, and the targeting agent on the end of the 5K. We'll just focus on those. So here is without any mannose, and that's basically background. That's just the phenocytosis of the macrophage is sort of gobbling up whatever's in their vicinity. We go up here to 10% mannose functionalization and the uptake, it's, uh, it's targeting well. So we get strong uptake. How about just adding more? Doesn't that help? No, it doesn't help. It actually goes back to baseline. So why does that happen? There's this really narrowly defined optimum for the mannose presentation on these particles. 
And we were the first ones to see this. It's now reported, been reported for folates and been reported for a uh, CACO cell line for transport across the GI tract. And what's happening here, Debbie Laskin is a macrophage expert who's a part of this collaboration. If you look at these cells here, what's happened is that once the nanoparticle lights onto the mannose receptors on the macrophage, that's supposed to, that starts a cascade inside the cell, which builds cytoskeleton, it's supposed to invaginate and make an endosome. It apparently overstimulates that. So on a confocal, if you look at these particles out here, the place where the bright fluorescent spots are, the actual the film has been raised up is a, is a bowl. So it has rigidified that, that layer so much that it can't invaginate. They're still stuck on the surface, but once you decorate that surface, you basically blind the macrophage and you don't get any more uptake. So there's an optimum, there's a, a size, optimum density for uptake, which I think is a really important thing in this targeting field to be able to understand what those are for different cell types you're targeting and different nanoparticles. Um, you could show that it's, it is mannose uh, regulated. So this is the uptake for the methoxy terminated. You add a sugar to it, um, in, in this case dextran, and you block those mannose receptors and you decrease the uptake. These are the OH terminated ones. Adding dextran doesn't stop that. So the internalization mechanism for the OH terminated pegs is a different mechanism. It's not apparently a mannose receptor mediated uptake, but it's a really efficient uptake mechanism for these particular macrophages. Uh, and now let's go to the delivery part. So that's the nanoparticles we would want to deliver. And so now um, this goes back to a slide with Gunter Oberdorster, part of this original Gates uh, grant. And the idea here is you look at, this is uh, Gunter's data, slow cleared fraction. These are particles that stay on the lungs a long period of time, and this is the particle size. If you make particles too big, they get quickly cleared by macrophages from the lungs. So aerosol, you inhale them, they get cleared. If they're really small, again, they get cleared because they just go through the endothelial cells in the bloodstream. That's how you will deliver asthma sprays, for example. So the steroids solubilized, and then they're cleared quickly. So there's a sweet spot around 50 to 100 nanometers, which is too big to go directly through the endothelial cells, but is too small to initiate the macrophage response. So that's what we're shooting for, is we want those to keep this drug in the lungs for a long period of time. But if you have drugs in this size, it's extremely difficult to uh, aerosolize or inhale or capture them in the lungs. So this is actually Tony Hickey's reference right there, uh, showing that you want particles in this one to three micron range. Too small, they breathe in and out, they're not captured. Too big, they impact the back of the throat and aren't captured. So how do you do this two things? How do we get a one to three micron particle, but how do we get a hundred nanometer particle? The way you do that is you spray dry, and this is Dave Edwards' technology, you spray dry our nanoparticles in with a matrix forming material to make these crenelated uh, porous particles. So this gives you the larger size, however it's made from either leucine or, or mannose. So when it hits the wet lung environment, when it's captured, it immediately dissolves and releases the 100 nanometer particles on the lungs. So this avoids the macrophage recognition by having the immediate dissolution of that larger matrix material. And Dave Edwards is the expert at coming up with spray drying conditions that will give you this crenelated surface. You want that because you don't want these particles sticking together inside the inhaler, so it allows them to be aerosolized much more efficiently. Um, so what we're going to do is, as I said, we're going to take our uh, formulation and we can take our mixer right into the inlet of a spray dryer where this sugar or leucine is coming in in one stream and make the nanoparticles in situ. And Ying Lu, a really gifted student, would get a suitcase with our Harvard syringe pumps, get on the Amtrak, go up to Boston, hook, here is our uh, confined and pinion jet mixers hooked in the inlet of Dave's uh, huge Nairo spray dryer, which was really not scaled well with the research university, but that's what he had. And uh, so we're making these in situ. <clears throat> Here are, uh, we actually made a set of these rifampicin particles separately and injected them in the spray dryer. We just wanted to see, are they in fact, when you dissolve the matrix, do they re, uh, disperse back to the original nanoparticle form? So here are the original ones, 170 nanometers, put in this form right here. This is 50% nanoparticles. So we have really high loadings of nanoparticles here. You put it in water and it disperses back to these 100 and, uh, 
40 nanometer particle, 145 nanometer particles. So you do not get aggregation during this drying process because the dense peg layers on our surface keep the particles from aggregating. So here we have a way of getting an aerosol formulation to get deep lung, lung delivery, but then being able to present these smaller particles, which will be stay resident in the lung for longer periods of time. That's one technique, using Dave's technique of this really careful drying to make these crenellated particles. Um, as I said, we worked with Amgen, and they had commercialized a process called spray freeze drying. Actually, they built the plant, they put the line together, and then they killed the project at the very end. But they had demonstrated they could scale this spray freeze drying process up. And here's what you do. So you have a ultrasonic atomization, and the spray now falls into liquid nitrogen, or a a cooled liquid nitrogen is convenient, and it freezes the drops. What this allows you to do is to separate out the size of the particle from the solids concentration or density of the particle. And so here are a series of particles made at different solids concentration, 1% to 50% solids, and the solid here is mannitol, lysozyme, or BSA. And these are all spray dried under conditions where you have about 20 micron droplets, which then freeze, you then take that frozen material, you lyophilize it, and now you're lyophilizing all the water out. And so you can see we maintain, they all have essentially the same particle size, but their densities are different. So this is contrasting, this is normal spray drying where with mannitol, where these dilute solutions, as they dry, the thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more dense until you get to this structure here. Um, in this spray freeze drying, we can make these porous particles where we can change the density of the particle by the amount of solids in the initial spray. Here's the sizes of these particles. You see they're all 20 uh, microns plus or minus eight for all of these different concentrations. So we can make a particle droplet separate from its loading. And then this is uh, work in Kim Chan's lab, a uh, cascade aerosol impactor, looking at the uh, mannitol percent, that's how much you're capturing in this cascade impactor at different sizes of particles here. So this would be larger particles be captured in the throat, and what you want, the smaller particles are captured in the lungs. You go to the literature, Dave Edwards and others in the literature, and the prediction is there that the aerodynamic size of particles goes with the square root of density times the geometric size. And the argument here is that if I have a great big low density material, it will follow the airstream and inertially not be captured. So the capture in these airflows is a dense particle with inertia moves across streamlines and hits the surface. But if I make it less dense, it follows the streamlines and doesn't have the inertia to cause it to cross streamlines and to precipitate. This is you know, widely quoted, but there's actually no literature showing constant size particles of variable density until our data. And so here are the particles. This is the fine particle fraction. So these would be things under this three microns. This is the constant square root of concentration as predicted by that. And so you can see for the lysozyme and mannitol, it follows this square root to the half dependence. Uh, BSA doesn't because the BSA particles are sticky towards each other, and so you never get a fine particle fraction. They don't aerosolize easily from the inhaler. They're too sticky towards each other. Okay, so thank you for your time. So here's what we've covered. So we talked about why we want to make nanoparticles, our block polymer directed uh, rapid precipitation, crucial there is the right micromixing and sort of the engineering behind that. We control particle size easily by controlling supersaturation. And then we talked about release, where we can now tune release from a few minutes to 30 days, depending on the conjugation chemistry. So you just go to your organic chemistry book and you find conjugates that release at the right rates that you can tune your release rate over that period of time. Um, and then multifunctional nanoparticles, the fact that in this rapid precipitation, as long as the components are hydrophobic, they don't care what they are, they're going to stick to the first thing they see because they're so supersaturated. So that can be drug A, drug B, drug A, imaging agent B, any combination we can make stoichiometric ratios of materials in nanoparticle form. And then targeting the surface functionalization and uh, uh, that our technique allows you for smaller molecule targeting agents up to 14,000 molecular weight. We can put them on the block of polymer and quantitatively assemble them. If you want to go to antibodies, then no, we have to put a malleimid group or a paranitrophenol or a click chemistry on the end of the peg chain and post-react on. Uh, and that's we've done that. We have examples of that. But I think the really interest, industrial interesting stuff 
is being able to do all the pre-purification and then to quantitatively make these at scale. So thank you for your attention and time and uh, going a little longer, but I, there may be some lunch left outside. Any questions? Thank you. Stun silence. That's... Okay. Thank you. So with the mannose targeting, I, I actually was going to ask you about saturation, and you sort of answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean you have some concern about the sorts of drugs that you could deliver that way? Because there's certainly going to be a dose limitation in terms of how much you can get up. Had you thought about what the dose would be that you would be constrained to? That is, at this optimum mannose concentration, how much could I deliver per macrophage? Yeah. Yeah. Um, rule of thumb, we can deliver um, 30 to 40 weight percent of the total nanoparticle weight can be drug for those conjugates I showed you. So uh, this, um, okay, not shown here. Okay, this is micrograms. Uh, associated per 96 well plate bottom. In the paper, we do it per macrophage. But, so this is a 96 well plate, and these are the micrograms of uh, nanoparticles, which were internalized by all the macrophages in that. OK. Yeah, I think that sort of gets, I mean, it, it, you have to translate that into how many millions of macrophages, but it seems like it's a reasonable focus. Yeah. Sorry, let me give you the microphone, please. Okay. I was wondering if you've combined the imaging, say MRI imaging, with the aerosol delivery yet? We have not, and that's probably a, the most difficult one. I didn't show you the MRI animal images, but the lung uh, MRI works on contrast, and the lung is air, and so that's a lousy MRI contrast, and so that's the hardest thing to see is things in the lung just because the MRI is insensitive to that, to the air uh, in the lung. So that's why PET imaging is probably, and these very long wavelength imaging we're doing, is the way to image whether things are going in the lungs or not, which we're, we're doing. But it would just be wonderful to have an imaging technique with aerosol delivery. Yes, and I think you can do that with long wavelength dyes. And, and I, we have a paper which we're just sending back the reviews uh, using a long wavelength dye uh, based on porphyrin, and we can see animal lungs uh, and deposition lungs. And, it, and it, PET imaging allows you to do it too, but then you need the special radioactive in PET. So long wavelength dyes is the way they do it. And we're actually talking to Group Nirvana, which is one of your neighbors, about uh, collaborating in, in these long wavelength dyes for animal imaging. How, um, with the polystyrene uh, copolymer, did you ever even go lower for the molecular weight? Because you had it at 1,000 and it had a really good, so I was wondering if it went lower. And it, did it depend on the drug? If you had a slightly more hydrophilic drug, would that affect the, the amount of PEG that you could get onto the drug particle? Uh, both good questions, um, which we haven't looked at either lower, I'll tell you why, and uh, we haven't looked at the drug the PEG effectiveness in circulation that is protecting it. If you went too low in PEG, I think you would get the problem of, like we showed with the peptides, that it may not be a uniform coverage. But I, I more importantly... I, I didn't mean PEG, I meant the styrene. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, the styrene, yep. Yeah. If the styrene is too small, you may not get sufficient anchoring energy, so you may get patchiness or, or uneven distribution. Okay. More importantly, these particular polymers are made by anionic polymerization, and anionic polymerization gives you a really narrow size distribution when you're above 1,000, you know, when you're above 10 or 20 units. You try going below that, and the polyspersity gets horrible. And so you could probably do ATRP or something like that to get narrow hydrophobic fractions smaller than that, but with the anionic polymerization, uh, you sort of uh, end up not knowing what you've made when you go much smaller than 1,000.
Any other questions? I, I actually have one last one, and then <laughs> so for the uh, for the sequela drug and the transporter knockout. Uh, did you do that in animals, or was that done? It was no. And again, uh, we had these you know great in vitro results, and then as I said, Sequela's board said uh, that's the end. We're going to get out of TB, and we just haven't had the energy to try for you know the, well, and they're no longer. I don't have access to a, a BSL three lab to do animal studies, nor the funding to do it. But I'd be very interested in it because I think we have a lot of interesting preliminary data. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, there is a question. Uh, just a tiny step away. So you did mention that you were working with antibodies for targeting. And I just wanted to ask if that uh, correlation between the peg length and density of targeting was consistent through the low molecular weight targeting towards the antibodies. Oops. Say that one more time. So, okay, the relationship between um, the basically the size of your targeting moiety and the, uh, was the re um, correlation between the peg length and the peg density and the density of the targeting. This would say. Cor so I didn't say um, that the white dots are 2K. Steric stabilizing and 5K uh, mannose targeting chain. So that's a longer chain that could potentially could reach out past the steric protecting layer. What you find is that 0% mannose, that is just the 2K, you get much more uptake. So the 2K layer is not protective enough against protein adsorption. So that's not, not good. And that's sort of known for the liposome world too, that people know you get on 2K and you're not getting as much stealth uh, protection as you do at 5K. But the maximum here is pretty much the same. So it, our hypothesis was that if it stuck out further, it wouldn't be interfered with by all the other peg chains. It's not folded down as frequently. And so the uptake might be better. But, but it really doesn't make much difference. So now we haven't done the experiment of 2K uh, stealth layer plus mannose on a 